This is the seventh session in the Web Forum series, Land Use 2021, A Place for Biodiversity Offsets, brought to you by the Alberta Land Institute. My name is Dave Poulton. I'm director of the Institute. We are a nonpartisan land use policy research institute based at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta. You can learn more about us by visiting the ALI Expo booth by clicking on the Expo icon on the left side of your screen. You can also access materials and videos from some of today's speakers there. We at the University of Alberta acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continue to enrich our vibrant community. Today, we continue to draw back the lens in our series to look at the broader issues and suite of, of tools respecting market-based conservation. In earlier sessions, we looked at the key design issues on offsetting for biodiversity and the questions and limitations that they imply. Some of these questions pointed to the need to identify our environmental objectives clearly and to allocate costs appropriately. We've heard that one of the mechanisms by which offsetting can improve our environmental performance is by imposing on, de on developers the replacement costs of their environmental values they impact. That creates an incentive to avoid and minimize their impacts. But offsetting is only one tool that uses prices to produce environmental benefits. A whole suite of market-based instruments, MBIs, has been developed in different parts of the globe. Some of these incorporate or complement offsetting. Some are quite distinct from it. Today, we hear experiences with respect to policies in a wide variety of environmental and policy situations. As their fuller biographies are available below on the stage screen, I'll keep my introduction of today's speakers brief. Today, we'll be hearing from Carmen Cantuarias. Carmen is Associate Professor of Economics at Group ESPI, L'Ecole Supérieure de Profession Immobilière in Paris, and has been involved in policy development the French Ministry of Environment. Christopher Wally Wright is a research scientist at the Puget Sound Institute at the University of Washington in Tacoma. Paige Olmsted is a senior program associate at the Smart Prosperity Institute at the University of Ottawa with her, with her work focusing on conservation finance. Jillian Kerr is a postdoctoral fellow at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Her PhD research focused on the implementation of MBIs in Alberta. And to lead today's session, I'm very pleased to welcome one of the premier scholars in this field, Professor James Salzman. Jim is the Donald Bren Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law at the UCLA School of Law and the Bren School of Environment at UC Santa Barbara. He's the author of some of the most cited and influential articles on the subject of market-based conservation and has worked with governments and universities around the world. Jim, I'm happy to yield the session to you to get us started. Terrific, thanks Dave. So for the next 25 minutes, uh, I'd like to, to talk with you about sort of what's happening with payments for ecosystem services around the world, what they are, how we should think about them. As Dave mentioned, I've worked in this space for, for quite a long time now, over, over two decades, uh, and it's been, it's been quite extraordinary. Now, my understanding is that some of you in the audience are quite familiar with ecosystem services and payment for ecosystem services, or PES, as I'm going to call it. Uh, and others less so. So I thought I'd use the first part of the talk to really bring everyone up to speed to the strategy and the thinking behind PES, and then use the second half to talk about what we know in terms of uptake of PES, what's worked, what hasn't worked, where has it worked, uh, and what, what further work needs to, be, needs to be done. So Gretchen Daly's definition, I think, is as good as any. Uh, she calls ecosystem services conditions and processes which eco natural ecosystems sustain and fulfill human life. There are a lot of different ways one can slice and dice the, uh, the whole category of ecosystem services. I find personally this, this is a useful way to do it. Uh, so there are several ways to think about it. One is the ecosystem service of translocation, moving things from one place to another, obviously incredibly important for agriculture uh, and for plants more generally. The second is stabilization services. Uh, pest control. The vast majority of pest control is not through pesticides. Uh, it's through natural predation. Climate regulation, obviously, carbon sequestration, water metering, filtering through the soil, mitigating droughts, uh, and flood control. And then the final category that I think of as useful is cycling and filtration, uh, water purification, uh, breaking down waste, uh, and renewing 
renewing soil fertility. Now, we've known about the importance of ecosystem services for a very long time. This is who Google says uh, Plato was. Who knows? Well, for our purposes, we'll assume this was Plato. Uh, and he was talking about the um, basically uh, the ecosystem service of mitigating droughts, right? Water basically is metered out uh, from the landscape over time. You would think that because ecosystem services are quite literally critical and essential to human well-being, that they would be prized by markets and protected by the law. And that's just not the case. So the question is, why is that? And there are really sort of a few, a few things that are driving that. The first is ignorance. Uh, we, we take ecosystem services for granted, right? We don't really think about carbon sequestration. We don't think about flood protection until it fails. For instance, it happened with Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Moreover, the biophysical provision of how services come to us is poorly understood. And I think it's interesting to note that we are incredibly sophisticated about how to maximize the production of farmed crops, right? And the fact is when there is a market for how a landscape is managed, we're extremely sophisticated. The problem is we just haven't focused as much on how ecosystem services are provided. So for example, uh, we might say that a wetland is important for water purification, but what if we lose 5% or 10% of the acreage? What's the consequential impact on the water purification? We don't really know. That's an area of science that's just now being further and further researched. Second reason is market failure, right? Many ecosystem services are public goods. And as many of you know, public goods mean there aren't price signals to show you if they're being over overconsumed or not. The other trick about ecosystem services is their value depends on where they're provided on the landscape and to whom, right? The value of ecosystem services is the provision of services to populations, to humans. And of course, if there's no market signal, then we only learn about scarcity, at least for the market, after the problem has already, has already emerged. And then finally, there's institutional failure. Uh, the fact is that many of the boundaries, political boundaries, where ecosystem, serv ecosystem services are provided don't match the scale of the service provision. And so you get what economists call collective action problems. And the fact is, you know, when our laws were written, I think in pretty much every country in the world, ecosystem services were not part of the thinking. And so in many respects, as I tell my students when I talk about ecosystem services, it's a bit like serving soup with a fork, right? It's just hard to really know exactly exactly how well we're doing because the law wasn't designed to address service provision. So to make this a little more concrete, let's imagine a hypothetical situation where you have a watershed, right? And rain falls and snow falls, the uh, water flows down through a river to the town where it's used as a source of drinking water. But there's a problem. And the problem is that while some landowners, as you can see in the upper right quadrant, are very good at managing their land to protect the streams, Others aren't, right? And so you've got a water pollution problem downstream. Now let's say, for example, that our water engineers tell us that the least expensive way to address water pollution is to put in riparian buffers, as you can see in the upper right. That's gonna be less expensive than building a treatment plant. Question is, how are we going to do that? And so when I teach environmental law, I like to focus on mnemonics, right? Easy things to, to, to remember. So I talk about the five Ps. And it turns out actually that all of environmental law really is basically mixing and matching these five simple tools. Uh, there's prescriptive regulation, property rights, penalties, persuasion, and payment. So let me give you an example uh, from the case we were just talking about. So you might have prescriptive regulation you might pass a law that requires farmers to put in riparian fencing along the stream or river. You might have financial penalties. Uh, every meter of unfenced stream bank, we're gonna find you for that. A property doesn't work as well in, in this situation. You could have a tradable, tradable permit system. In persuasion, right, we do this a lot with farmers. We basically have pilot projects. We have educational approaches. There is though another way to go at this, and that's the fifth P. Why don't we think about the farmer's provision of ecosystem services as the same as providing other goods, right? We pay them to, to grow the crop of water quality is the idea, much as we do to pay for milk and potatoes, right? So the idea basically behind payments for ecosystem services is to expand the notion of what we think should be reimbursed from land management. And so the definition broadly of PES is the exchange of value for land, man land management practices they will provide or ensure, in other words, continue the provision of ecosystem services.
Michael Jenkins, who really is a pioneer in this field, he's got a wonderful phrase. He basically says, look, how do we make trees worth more standing than cut down? And for those of you who are more economically minded, the question is, how do we internalize positive externalities? Right now, the farmer only gets money from growing agricultural crops. The climate, the sequestration, the biodiversity habitat, the water purification that she provides, she doesn't get paid for that. In the world of PES, she gets paid for all four streams. And as a result, she's gonna manage her land differently. So that's all by way of background. Now let's start sort of honing in on what we see with PES around the world. Broadly speaking, there are three different types of PES approaches. The first is user financed. Okay, in this case, there are direct beneficiaries of the services. It might be individuals, it might be NGOs, it might be companies, and they basically pay the landholders. So classic example of this is actually the example I just gave you, which is lower watershed folks who benefit from cleaner water, perhaps from flood protection, they pay the upper watershed owners. Second category, which financially, as we'll see, is the largest single category, is government financed PES. In this case, it's not the direct beneficiaries that are paying, but agents on their behalf, usually governments. And so, for example, if a government or water utility, for example, is paying the upper water, uh, watershed owners to keep with our example before, that would be government financed PES if it happens to be a publicly owned water utility. So we'll talk about a bit later from government payments. That would be an example of this um, as well. And then compliance PES. So my understanding is that prior to today, you spent a good deal of time talking about offsets. That's an example of compliance PES, where there is a regulatory mandate uh, that in order to take on certain activities, usually destroying or, or, or degrading habitat, you have to basically offset what you're doing. You have to uh, basically get mitigation credits. And that's the last, the last category. Uh, I started working on PES in the late 1990s uh, with, with Gretchen Daly. And in, in terms of people who were writing about it back then, it was kind of lonely. But as you can see from this map, uh, this, this chart, there's been explosive, explosive growth. Uh, much of this is not due, in fact, none of this is probably due to me, but most of this is due, if not all, to interest that was spurred by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, that came out in the early 2000s. Walt Reed uh, chaired that, and he used the framework of ecosystem services, and that really generated a lot of interest. And there are other things as well going on we can talk about a bit later, uh, if you'd like, about what led to this, this explosion. Uh, my best example of just how mainstream PES has become is The Economist, which I sort of view as the magazine for capitalism. They feature this uh, as their cover story. Uh, in 2004, talking about the Amazon. And remarkably, they found a place where there was actually a dollar sign in the Amazon. Uh, if you look around the world, what you'll find is there's an enormous range of different approaches, right? Heterogeneity is the norm for the transaction type and the payment model that's used. And that's been growing as well. I mean, if you sort of plot this on a map, you find that there are different approaches all over the world. And I, as, as Dave said, I, I do a lot of, of speaking on PES. And really for the first, you know, until about 2010, 2015, I had a nagging, a nagging concern. And the concern I had was that there basically were these, these famous stories, the Catskills is probably the, the best known New York City's drinking water. And people talked about how big PES was and how important it was. And there were a few case studies, but I, I, I had a, a nagging feeling uh, or, or concern really, I didn't know really empirically how big PES was. Where is it important? Where is it not important? I know a few case studies, but what's going on more generally? And so I started a research project that basically tried to get four questions, right? How had PES evolved? Can we move beyond the anecdata of the well-known case studies? Where is PES going? And how would we know if PES, PES has worked or not worked? What, what, what does success mean when you're talking about PES? And so, whoops, let me go back for a sec. And so working with uh, colleagues at the, um, what's called the Ecosystem Marketplace. This was produced by the Forest Trends. They're um, really the leading NGO in the PES space. And they basically they try to be the Bloombergs uh, for PES. They track all these different kinds of transactions. They've done a lot of work. They have a lot of data. And so I worked together with them for four years. And we published an article in Nature Sustainability. This is the article that I'm gonna draw from that basically tried to answer the four questions that I posed earlier. 
uh, this remains the most comprehensive peer reviewed assessment of PES uh, around the globe. And I wanna basically share the findings with you in the last 10 minutes or so. So this basically is part of what the, what the article looks like. Essentially what we did is we looked at uh, watershed PES, habitat PES, and carbon PES. And for each sector, we looked at the different mechanisms that were used, there's a definition there, we would give examples. And the key part of this is the last three columns. And this was, excuse me, this was new data. Basically, how had the market grown? How many individual programs were they? And how many countries were these programs found in? And again, no one had ever done this before. And so this was kind of, you know, uh, so to use a, a car phrase, this is basically looking under the hood, seeing what, what's going on here. Actually, that's not a good analogy because it was also <laughs> figuring out, are you taking up the hood on, on a little mini or on, a, on, a, on an SUV or on a truck, right? So we sort of found that as well. So here are some of the take home messages that we found. So let's start with water. So water PES, watershed PES, it dominates in terms of the uh, amount uh, of money that is being transacted, that's going back and forth, the number of programs and the number of countries uh, that are doing this. And I'll talk at the end about why, about why that is. But the first thing is watershed PES dominates. The second is China dominates watershed PES. In the late 1990s, there were some terrible tragedies in China from erosion and, and floods and landslides and such. And China, as a national policy, decided they needed to basically uh, plant a lot more trees, to, 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 to put it simplistically. And they chose PES as the mechanism that they would use. Now, they were also attracted to the role of PES in addressing uh, poverty, right? There was basically a wealth transfer uh, to, to poor rural areas that was going on as well, and that was very explicit as part of the program. But China has spent literally tens of billions of dollars in the PES programs, and it remains a central part of their national environmental strategy. They actually, I'm working with them right now on an Asian Development Bank project, and they're drafting national framework legislation uh, to expand PES even more across the country. So China leads the way in terms of the size uh, of the programs. In terms of rapid growth though, although at a smaller scale, that's happening in Latin America. And these are water funds, collective action funds, and essentially the the, the base the, the the individual structure varies quite a bit depending on each each place. The basic idea, though, is you form some kind of endowment. You get local cities, companies, NGOs that put water into an endowment, and the endowment is, is managed by a third party, and the funds are paid to the upper watershed landowners. And that's become, as I said, a very a very popular approach. TNC Nature Conservancy really is spearheading this in Latin America. What's interesting is if you look at, we're talking about offsets, if you look at the regulatory programs, you don't find a lot of them. Uh, In-stream water, water quality trading. And the reason for that is twofold. The first is these are complicated programs to run. They require a lot of institutional agency capacity and also very secure property rights. And so literally a handful of countries have active in-stream water or water quality trading programs. Let's now turn to biodiversity and habitat. If watershed PES dominates, uh, biodiversity and habitat PES, particularly biodiversity, is kind of bringing up, bringing up the rear. What you find is that, frankly, there are not a lot of biodiversity PES programs, and the ones that exist uh, are small. You find basically climate compliance biodiversity in three or four countries um, where basically you have to offset habit biodiversity habitat. Similar challenges before, you need strong institutional infrastructure. There's been a lot of hope over the years about voluntary, uh, voluntary biodiversity offsets. That hasn't really emerged. The number is small in terms of both where you find it and the sums that are, um, that are being exchanged. Where you do find a lot of money, like several billion dollars changing hands, is mitigation banking and mitigation offsets, right? That's where wetlands in particular, stream banks, um, uh, where you basically have to get credits or offsets. And as I said, this is a multi-billion dollar activity, but you only find it really in the US, Canada to a degree, Ger Germany to a degree, Australia to a degree. And so it, it's small. And we'll talk later about, about why that is, why there's such a contrast between watershed and biodiversity. And finally, forest. I'm not going to talk a lot about forest because this is in the news, you know, quite a bit. The idea basically of carbon credits, 
Um, the markets have evolved incredibly rapidly. So many different markets are out there now compared to what there was just 10, 15 years ago. The fundamental challenge is that the supply of carbon sequestration far, far exceeds the demand. And this is both true for voluntary and for, and for compliance. One of the interesting aspects of this that's emerging, I think very quickly right now, is a number of companies that are establishing what's called zero carbon goals. The only way they're going to meet those is through offsets. And so it's very possible that uh, demand is going to start to meet supply. That hasn't been the case to date. The other big challenge is markets uh, for carbon sequestration. Uh, the hope had been that this uh, clean development mechanism, CDM, uh, the European Union's um, ETM program, uh, California's program, AB32, uh, that that would provide a large market. That hasn't really happened. Part of it has been concerns over credibility and legitimacy uh, of the offsets. Where are they coming from? Are they real? Are, are they really sequestering carbon um, or not? Are they really battling deforestation or not? The big challenge, I think, going forward, there's been a lot of interest in red, red plus. This basically was reduced emissions from land uh, degradation uh, and deforestation. This becomes much more difficult after the Paris Agreement. Prior to that, the Kyoto Protocol mechanism, you had a global trading platform. Paris Agreement is bottom up. And as a result of that, there are much higher transaction costs in creating any kind of markets for red plus credits because each country has to basically negotiate with another. So this, this, remains, this remains to be seen. I think one of the most interesting places right now in terms of, of, of sort of PES approaches, this is certification, is ag commodities. So it turns out that palm oil, soy, cattle, timber, and pulp these account for about 80% of deforestation in tropical forests. What you're seeing is really an explosion of certification bodies. Forestry, the Forestry Stewardship Council is the best known, but there are others as well. And companies are just piling on with these commitments, right? Over $4 trillion in market capitalization, over a third now have been made since 2014. Uh, there are very real questions, though, about how legitimate these commitments are. And whether the certification actually shows real uh, avoided deforestation or not. And again, we can talk about that uh, later also. There, there's some uh, data on this that, that's, quite, that's quite disturbing. The last thing I want to talk about with you this morning is, I think, in some respects, the most important question, which is, do these programs work, right? And, you know, I've shown you data on how big they are in terms of geographic scope, in terms of number of programs, in terms of, 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 of dollars transacted, that doesn't mean they work. That just means that there are programs, there are people buying and selling things. And so, you know, number of programs, value of transactions, geographic scope, that doesn't really tell you. Trees planted, hectares conserved is getting closer, but really, how would we know PES has made a difference on the ground? Um, and there are three different dimensions that we should care about, right? Is a service being provided? Is it being provided efficiently? And are the social welfare things we care about? You know, are we also trying to address poverty a reduction? Uh, as one example, as I said, that China has cared a great deal about. And what I was, I wouldn't say shocked, but surprised uh, to learn when I started doing this research is that we don't know. There are all kinds of studies on this. I've just given some of the better known ones, but essentially they all find the same thing, which is, you know, at a large scale, we don't really know when PES has positive environmental impacts and when it doesn't. And the reason for that is we don't know the counterfactuals. What would have happened without the PES? Are the actors uh, being strategic? And so wh why is this an issue? Uh, why is this a problem, I should say? Well, for one thing, a lot of times uh, these, these the studies are measuring proxies rather than service provision. Trees planted is not the same thing as water purified, as floods controlled. Baseline, where did we start at? What would have happened uh, without the PES? Would you have had the similar, similar effects? And again, this is because of case studies. And if you're relying on case studies, you're almost certainly going to have selection bias. And so um, this has been a real issue. And there, there are two studies in particular I'd, I'd point out to you that, that should give us some, some caution. So Alex Pfaff and colleagues, and they did a bunch of studies. This is just one of them, looked at Costa Rica. And Costa Rica is famous. They really had the first major nationwide PES program, uh, and they've been a model for many others. And what Alex and his colleagues found essentially was that very little land was protected from deforestation because the, the forest that was being entered, that was being basically enrolled into this, into this national program, was forest that was on steep hillsides and places that never would have been developed anyway. 
And so they're actually, we're not protecting from deforestation. They were just protecting forests that really didn't face any serious threat. Robert Heilmeier, slightly different uh, setup. He was looking at certification of palm oil in Indonesia. Uh, the idea was if you, if you certify it, it's, it's, it's ensuring there's not going to be further deforestation. The problem was the only lands that were certified were lands that had already been cut. Uh, and so there wasn't additional forest to be cut down. And the, the, the holdings of these companies where there might be deforestation, that wasn't certified, that wasn't entered. So there's a lot of strategic behavior that we have to be concerned about, especially with so much interest now with, with net zero and these other corporate, corporate commitments. So what I wanna end, uh, end with is kind of the, uh, the big overview, right? So if you look, uh, again, as I said, you've got, you know, in terms of number of programs, size and such, geographic spread, watershed dominates. Biodiversity is almost the exact opposite. Why is that? Well, basically in the paper, I and my co-authors say there are four things you really have to focus on for successful PES. Is there perceived scarcity? Is there an understanding that there's value in provision of these ecosystem services? And, and basically there's a reason to pay, right? If we get it for free, we don't care about it. Why would we pay to keep it? Is there a sense that we're going to lose this? You have to be concentrated buyers and sellers. You can't pay everyone uh, and you can't expect everyone to pay. Are there clear metrics? So we know that we're getting value for money, so to speak. We can measure what we're paying for. And are there institutions that basically allow these transactions to take place that aren't expensive? And watersheds have all of these. Biodiversity is none of these. People care about, they understand the value of clean water. Uh, they know the upper watershed owners. We know who is drinking the water downstream, who's basically paying their bill. We can measure water quality. We can measure trees and, and vegetation being cut or not being cut. And we have water utilities in place that can collect money from buyers and direct it to sellers. Biodiversity, by contrast, is the classic public good. And it meets none of these, maybe clear metrics. Um, but beyond that, it doesn't. And, and that, in very simple terms, is why we see such different such different experiences. And so with that, uh, I think on time, uh, I will stop and turn it back uh, to you, Dave. Thanks, Jim. That was an excellent introduction to today's subject. Very clear and invites, I think, a myriad of questions. And I'd like to invite Carmen Cantuarias now to join us and tell us about uh, the new, uh, new policy in this area in France. Hello, Carmen. Thank you, David. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation. It's a real pressure to me uh, to talk a little about uh, uh, what is happening here in France. I will present an exploratory project that uh, I work with some colleagues from the SP uh, Group School. We are a management school in real estate based in France, and um, we are trying to involve real estate in um, biodiversity finance. So this project is, um, is part of uh, a research project that I started when I had the opportunity to, to work in policy in the French environmental minister. So I will present some uh, context about um, uh, biodiversity banks here in France, how they create it and what are the benefits from the diversity law that we have since uh, 2016. Some data that we collected, some estimated also of uh, cost of settings, principle for infrastructure, uh, transport infrastructure, and some steps for our next uh, research. First of all, I would like to say that this, this biodiversity law that we have here in France emerged from an international comparison that we realized before this, uh, this reglamentation arrived. It is a multi-criterion analysis that we performance between uh, six countries, Germany, uh, Australia, United States, the Netherlands, England, and of course, our country. We identified some conditions for success to encourage the deployment of biodiversity banks. We are talking about uh, functioning of banks, uh, the presence of different types of banking uh, in this country, the kind of measures, land possession mechanism, the level of implementation, the duration uh, in time, the mechanism on control and monitoring, the stakeholders' uh, involvement, and of course, the uh, institutional framework all of these uh, countries. 
what we found is um, that um, if we isolate the France position, we identified that our framework was, uh, a, was uh, the more rigorous <laughs> and uh, a little robust in, in front of the other countries, that we have a very strict ecological equivalence and a strong involvement in stakeholders. But instead, we have some points to reinforce. The deployment of biodiversity bank, as you see here, is the lowest uh, point that we can um, find in this evaluation and of the financial mechanism that can help biodiversity banks uh, to emerge in, in, in our economy. Based on, on this analysis, we uh, conceptualize uh, what could be a French biodiversity bank that we call it in the law uh, a natural compensation site. How can we define these natural compensation sites? They are defined as economic instruments that uh, help us to again some. I was presenting the uh, the definition of what we use as um, uh, what we name uh, a natural compensation site. We designed it as an economic instrument for ecological restoration, and we wanted to that this instrument was focused on a territory, and we think that it could be a planning tool, a different level, and a city level, agglomeration level, and of course, on a regional level. So we start looking for the planification of a, of a place that has so many projects around time, and we wanted to compare this um, new planification way to introduce offsettings with the previous use of the biodiversity offsettings in the country. Before the law, we have only demand for offsettings. What is it? We uh, compensate and then someday, uh, no, I'm sorry, we build and someday compensate. So this compensation uh, don't use the two advantage of biodiversity banks that are pooling and of course anticipation. We change this, um, this operation as, to, as uh, the mechanism works in the other countries, and we build what we call today our biodiversity banks by including the option of uh, anticipating ecological compensation and, of course, pulling all of these different projects in time to have an ecological benefits uh, around the time and also in the planning of one territory. What is the objective of this research? Based in the natural compensation sites, we wanted to promote the development of these banks by public and also private stakeholders. Without winning next the mitigation hierarchy and of course the ecological equivalence that the French system, that the French system built. We would like to show that offsettings needs for transport infrastructure for the next 20 years require anticipation. And the first objective was to assess some cost of this infrastructure. We focus on rail, on road, on maritime and river infrastructure. We use the mapping control tool called uh, GMCU. It is a geographical national platform that help us to register of settings. And here, some results. They are the main estimates that we use in order to determine approximately what could be the site of our market. We evaluate two scenarios of sets. Uh, one with um, a low avoidance and minimize strategies and the other one with a strong avoiding and minimize strategy supporting the mitigation hierarchy. We have also two scenarios of infrastructure development. This, this scenario was built for a national uh, commission that revise every 20 years how many infrastructure we will build. So based in these um, future projects, we estimate that the market uh, could be between 655 million and 1,410 million. It's around. And we can build between 52 natural sites to uh, uh, more than 100. What we will do 
with this uh, different uh, biodiversity banks? What is the first question that we made us? And um, we think that it is an excellent opportunity to have a restoration network in the country, based in what we have previously offset and what we will offset in the next years. So today, this commission is uh, analyzing new scenario, how these infrastructure tools uh, were developed in the next 20 years. We use um, as um, operation type dimension, what we have the best and uh, what is our first experimental operation, but today is um, is an aggregated offsetting operation that is in the southeast of, Fran of France that is called COSUR operation. Is the successful operation that was value um, 12 and a half millions. Another interesting indicator that we use for these estimates is what we call the offsetting radio. The cost of offsetting uh, owned the investment observed in the previous operation. Uh, we also use some expert advice. We found that offsetting could be between 1% to 10% of the cost of one infrastructure operation. So, based on these different estimates, we would like to reduce the risk and to uh, involve public and private uh, stakeholders to invest in this uh, network and in this restoration networking in the country. What we will would like to continue in this research, we will include some uh, renewables energy a scenario of deployment. We need to make some sensitive analysis. We also have to take into account the next com the next commission results because um, they are revising some priority in front of the COVID crisis. And of course, we have a net policy uh, to against artificialization. Uh, some new scenario will arrive for the next 30 and 50 years. So here's an example that what is emergency in, um, in biodiversity banking here in, in this region. I will add, I, I add some reference of um, these different um, uh, works that I see it. Uh, you will find it in the presentation and some of them are also in the expo, in the expo session. So thank you again and um, happy to discuss uh, at the discussion time. Thank you for that, Carmen. Uh, really, really fascinating to see how, uh, how these concepts are being applied on the ground in France. Um, our next speaker is Christopher Wally Wright, who will um, be speaking about the application of, of PES schemes in Puget Sound in Washington State. So my name is Chris Wally Wright. I'm a research scientist at the Puget Sound Institute at the University of Washington Tacoma in Washington State. Uh, so we have quite the international audience and crowd today, so that's great. Uh, very excited to be here. Just wanted to acknowledge that the Puget Sound Institute at the University of Washington Tacoma is on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, including the traditional lands of the Puyallup tribe. As I'm coming to you virtually, I am joining from the lands of the Wisco and Rash Wish Wish Wishroom people uh, in South Central Washington State. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the landscape of mitigation banking, market-based instruments, and ecosystem services in Puget Sound. Uh, so this map on the front slide here is just to sort of orient you to the area. Um, you can see where we're at, um, primarily right around the Seattle area there. That's Puget Sound. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a little bit about why is why do we care uh, and what can be done about it? So here you can see sort of a, a little map of the development that's happening in this region. Like most of the areas that you all are you know, situated in, I'm sure development is running rampant. Um, you know, oftentimes we're seeing that, uh, particularly in this region, um, you know, with the growing metropolis of Seattle, development is encroaching, encroaching further out and taking away uh, agricultural and forest lands. So here's just some statistics around that. Um, we have around 4.2 million people in Puget Sound, over 1.6 million acres. Uh, we've been losing around 14,000 acres of farmland annually through 2007. 
And less than 600,000 acres of farmland still exist, and only around 30,000 of those are protected by easements. Um, in the last 15 years or so, prior to 2016, uh, 97,000 uh, plus acres of agricultural land were converted. So my research really focuses on why and what can be done about it. One of the things that we're looking at here is, well, what happens when we try and look at ecosystem services compensatory mitigation measures in other areas uh, that can kind of slot in when regulatory measures uh, aren't working as well. Um, so in my research, uh, I do a lot of qualitative interviewing and I'm uh, working in that area. So I've spoken with all the, over 30 agency representatives, landowner, landowners, conservation nonprofits, um, city, county, state government officials. So what I found, and then I'll just kind of lay the ground before I dive into a little bit of these details here, is that I think as James uh, mentioned, measuring success for ecosystem services for any of these things is really challenging, right? You can find administrative success. You can say, hey, we've reached out to 100 landowners. They've all signed up for this program. But ecological success or measuring any kind of changes in the ecosystem, it can take decades. So we're really looking at a, at a time scale here that's pretty challenging to say, hey, this program, this water quality trading program, it really worked or not because we don't have the data to back that one up. That's getting a little bit better, but that's definitely a big challenge. Uh, one of the second ones I wanted to talk about was that the aspect of the regulatory program, the stick, right, versus the carrot. Uh, that's really relying on agencies' capacities to actually administer um, and enforce. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute, but that's a really challenging area. So that kind of stick mentality should be supplemented with voluntary measures. Um, and lastly, I think also as, as uh, Jim spoke about, ecosystem service markets are emerging, but supply is high in a lot of them and, and demand is low. Um, so just in Puget Sound, I'll just kind of give you a little bit of the lay of the land spoke, so to speak. Um, in terms of compensatory mitigation mechanisms, uh, we have 19 banks, uh, mitigation banks. Uh, they are administered by the Department of Ecology, the Washington State Department of Ecology. Um, and they were established based uh, on the compensatory mitigation for losses of aquatic resources rule, which is authorized in 2008 uh, by the United States uh, EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers. And it authorizes two uh, types of third party compensatory mitigation mechanisms, mitigation banking and inward fee payments. So as I mentioned in Washington, uh, we have 19 banks, three are in development. Uh, the 19 banks uh, cover around 5,000 acres and three banks are under review right now for over uh, 970 acres. Now, we also have three uh, in lieu fee programs as well. And these in lieu fee programs allow for landowners to make a one-time one payment to the ILF program instead of implementing uh, their own mitigation project. Uh, we've had a variety of uh, successful um, uh, uh, sites for in lieu fee programs, including some um, from the Department of Transportation where they wanted to widen the highway and in return for that, they purchased a, a 17 acre wetland as well as uh, actually the United States Navy uh, paid $6.9 million uh, to offset the damages uh, caused by uh, a wharf uh, expansion and construction projects. So there's two little examples of that. Um, there's a lot of challenges with mitigation banking and in lieu fee programs, particularly uh, in this area. Uh, one is identifying suitable marine uh, shoreline for sale. Um, and sometimes the, the, you know, the, the time scale of these is that it's years and years and years for these to go through the process uh, of approval. And so sometimes the land is just not available or the landowner, uh, whether it's private or otherwise, isn't interested in the sale anymore. So you've lost the potential for, for, for that acreage. Um, otherwise, uh, another challenge noted from a lot of folks that I spoke with was uh, just really the challenge of working with the agencies and these agencies are under-resourced and uh, they're really facing a lot of constraints and they're the ones that have to approve all the banks. So these banks uh, that I spoke with that are waiting, uh, some have been waiting for, for many, many years to be approved. Uh, so time is ticking and, and we're losing out uh, um, on potential uh, you know, mitigation measures and, and ecosystems uh, when we have to wait for, for that kind of approval. Um, I want to talk about a little bit other uh, sort of uh, potentials of what we're seeing and success stories uh, in Washington. One would be community forests. In community forests, there's really three primary community forests um, <clears throat> in Washington State. Uh, the Nisqually Community Forest, the Mount Adams Community Forest, and the Tianaway uh, 
Um, the, Nis uh, the Nisqually has really been a pretty big success, success story. Um, they are, are at around uh, 2,000 acres, and actually in just May 2021, they added another 2,200 acres for sale uh, of $9.6 million. So you can sort of see the scale of what we're talking about here. That land is not cheap, um, and it's not a lot, but it's doing a little bit. And community forests are um, a shared uh, forest, right? It's, it's a shared residence, cultural, or across political jurisdictions. And for all of these community forests, um, they have uh, a mix of nonprofit ownership, tribal ownership, city, county, uh, or state uh, ownership, some DNR ownership as well. So it's really that mix. And what it's seeing is it's offering opportunity for uh, sustainable, sustainable timber harvesting, uh, recreation opportunities, uh, carbon offset sales from uh, timber, et cetera. So it's, it's that kind of way to see forest managed in, in a di little bit of a different uh, environment in different situation. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about um, market-based mechanisms, conservation finance. We talked a little bit about, James sort of mentioned the ideas of, of you know, using these for ecosystem services. Um, and one of the ones that I'm looking at right now is something called forest resilience bonds. And these are financial tools that enable private, for, private investment for forest enhancements on public land. Um, there are no uh, market-based bonds in Washington state, um, but two uh, areas in Washington state, Puget Sound in particular, were awarded the United States Forest Service uh, uh, Innovative Finance for National Forest Grant Program. And that's at least sort of laid the groundwork for feasibility studies. Um, one of those is a, a rental around $100,000 grant to um, the Mount St. Helens Institute, which is right outside of Mount St. Helens, which is, if anyone's familiar with that, it's a volcano that blew up in 1980. Uh, Pretty great spot to go for a hike if you're interested. But this institute is investigating the feasibility of an outdoor recreation focused environmental impact bond. Um, another uh, grant was given to the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest to measure outcome based financing to pay for infrastructure improvements um, along a particularly used uh, access highway. Um, so that's what we're looking at uh, recreation based financing right there. Um, and there's a couple other areas. Um, there's a really cool project, not in Washington, but uh, around Yuba City, California, that is um, doing another type of market-based bond. And I'd be happy to speak a little bit about that one. Um, it's outside of Puget Sound, but I see that as a really innovative way forward for, for payment for ecosystem services. Um, one of the last areas that I'm really looking into uh, right now, I've done a, a fair amount of uh, work in, is the transfer and purchase of development rights. And I'm sure most of you have heard about this before, um, it's just kind of getting off the ground here in Puget Sound. Um, it's a voluntary incentive and market-based tool that can help jurisdictions meet their growth and conservation goals and provide economic and environmental benefits. Essentially, um, a, a developer in an urban area can purchase development rights from an agricultural area in order to get uh, density bonuses or to build higher uh, so as you can imagine, in Seattle, it's expanding so much developers are purchasing more of these development rights in order to build higher skyscrapers or expand in an urban area from agricultural areas. The development right then preserves that agricultural area. Um, one of the things I'm looking at right now is how that has shifted with COVID. What happens when your urban area is not growing as much? What happens when uh, the downtown core of Seattle that relied on Amazon and Microsoft and some of the big tech companies to, build, to grow once that's spread across disparate areas, how is that sort of changing the market? So once again, that's a supply and demand kind of situation right there. I'd be happy to speak a little about that or answer any questions around uh, transfer development rights or the purchase of development rights, which is exactly what it sounds like. You just buy it, you don't transfer it, and then the agricultural land is then protected. The last thing I wanted to speak about just in the last minute I have here, and this is my last slide, is just talking a little bit about some of the carbon credit efforts. Um, as as a, Jim also mentioned, um, you know, this is really reliant on, on the market here. Um, what we're seeing, uh, at least there is some promise. Um, the, the House uh, in Washington state passed uh, this bill that is looking to value the carbon and forest repair and easement. So that kind of set up the situation for the potential there. And it provides for all state, for the state to develop methods, protocols and markets for valuing uh, carbon. A couple of these other areas here are just some kind of examples of where carbon credit offsets and, and monitoring is going. Uh, so the United States Department of Agriculture 
uh, National Resource Conservation Service Comet Farm Tool, it's called, uh, is looking to quantify the impacts of adopting carbon practices uh, in farms and ranches. Um, in Oregon, our, our, our neighbor just to the south, uh, the city of Astoria actually has a voluntary carbon program, um, and they've actually, uh, uh, they actually um, preserved a little bit of a nearby forest, and through the sales of those carbon <clears throat> offsets, they actually brought in a million dollars in revenue to the city. So that was an interesting, uh, you know, opportunity for a little bit of municipal uh, involvement in the, in the carbon offset market. Um, there is a startup firm uh, based in the Puget Sound called Nori that is looking to pay farmers for carbon renew, uh, removal, and they're actually been growing pretty well. Um, this is mentioned IBM and uh, their blockchain platform for emerging carbon credit management system. And then we have some really interesting uh, academic studies in the area as well, such as coming out of Western Washington University up in Bellingham, which is quite close to the uh, Canadian border up there by Vancouver. And they've been looking at uh, a still Guamish River estuary and trying to quantify the climate benefits of um, tidal marsh restoration. So there is some sort of examples of what I've been looking at in terms of um, of, of carbon offsets here. One of those, one of the challenges there is, as Dave mentioned, it's really about what is the market uh, looking at right now. And we need to, uh, you know, as an institution and as uh, folks who are, who are concerned about these kinds of things, we need to keep on working on this and develop these mechanisms that are going to allow uh, for a little bit more of the evening of supply and demand. And I'd be happy to speak a little bit about those, uh, in, including how to work with risk with investors to sort of diffuse risk. Uh, and stack revenue from a variety of sources um, in order to, to convince investors to invest in, in carbon, and that may be uh, leveraging timber and agroforestry products or other agricultural products uh, in that kind of stack of, of, of investment opportunities. Um, so with that, I wanted to stop sharing, and I will pass it back over to Dave. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Really, really good, interesting stuff there. Um, and I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Paige Olmsted from the Smart Prosperity Institute in Ottawa. Paige, over to you. Thanks. So I'll be speaking, we've heard from these international global examples, um, and I'm going to be speaking to the Canadian context, specifically looking at how we can scale investment in nature in Canada um, and consider a range of market-based instruments, including several that we've already heard about today. Specifically, I'm going to be referencing a lot of the content that's been shared in the expo um, in this Invest in Nature report that the Smart Prosperity Institute recently released and in which I was the lead author. Um, we look at a variety of financial mechanisms and market-based instruments and the way that we broke it up in the report is across these different land use types, recognizing that, of course, there's overlap, but there's certain strategies that are more um, relevant or applicable in particular uh, landscapes. Briefly, um, we looked at a variety of instruments. Um, I've got a summary of several of them on the right here, um, looking at how they're currently applied in Canada, who the key actors are, the policy environment in Canada to support them or their current status, um, and how we can grow some of these markets in Canada. It's sort of surprising when you think of our natural resource base here um, that most of these markets are quite limited or in nascent stages compared to the US or the EU or Australia or where we often hear it, China as well, and many of these global examples. And so for these different types of instruments on the right, several of which Chris just mentioned, um, all of them, with the exception of resilience bonds, which also have not yet been in place, although there's a number of people looking into them, um, exist in Canada in some capacity. Um, but as I mentioned, it is quite nascent. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about why and why also it seems like an opportune time that we can actually scale a number of these strategies and deliver real results for nature. A few limitations. Jillian, the next speaker, is going to dive into some specifics in a, a regional context. But something that happens for many market-based instruments across Canada are our existing regulatory constraints. I'll just use the habitat and species banking as an example. That's where we have no third party actors. And so while wetland mitigation banking is massive in the US, at least in terms of transactions, as Jim mentioned, um, because this is a proponent paying for a specific type of restoration, we don't have the capacity here to have the economies of scale of landscape scale restoration by a third party uh, and then individual project proponents can buy into that bank. And so that's something that is sort of holding back that market here. 
In terms of PES or payment for ecosystem services, it exists in a variety of contexts, especially in agriculture across Canada. There are some regional approaches, um, but again, there's not a sort of cohesive approach or national level incentives that are currently in place. When it comes to carbon, Crown land in Canada poses, makes a major difference compared to a lot of other jurisdictions um, with 80% of our forested managed forest being crown land and more in some areas. Um, the question of carbon rights becomes an issue. Can you sell an offset from these lands? And then also in Canada's north, we have a ton of carbon rich landscapes, both forested and peat lands, but because of the lack of additionality. So the idea that these lands are not at risk of conversion, we currently under the current models cannot generate offset from those, despite many communities that could absolutely benefit from being compensated for stewardship of those landscapes. Um, I'll also mention briefly some of these credit markets that have come up and thinking about water quality management and other types of water management. Again, in many municipalities across Canada, there's opportunities to do small scale activities to generate stormwater credits for developers, but it doesn't have the kind of scale, again, I'll use the US as an example, where certain um, provisions under the, the Clean Water Act allow, there's, I'll use Washington DC as an example, there's a price floor. So there's, the government is guaranteed buyer of stormwater credits. So that gives restoration companies the capacity to go out link or find biodiversity corridors to connect landscapes, um, to do a variety of restoration projects, recognizing that there's likely gonna be a developer that could be a buyer, or at least have the guaranteed price coming from the government. And so it's just that market confidence that allows more restoration to take place. In all of these examples in Canada, because we tend to have a lot of pilot projects, um, or things that happen relatively slowly, there's high transaction costs, and this is also a barrier to market entry. However, on the plus side, um, there's a lot of interesting things happening at the moment. In terms of 2030 targets for carbon or GHG reductions, Canada's made significant commitments. Um, at the same time for 2030, we've committed to protect 30% of lands and oceans. And in recent budgets and other recent federal announcements, and I've just got a few examples here. There's an additional $4 billion for conservation towards the conservation targets, $3 billion for the Nature-Based Climate Solution Fund. This is partially the, the 2 billion trees announcement, but other types of restoration activities. Um, other types of funding mechanisms are including natural infrastructure ahead of or alongside gray infrastructure. And so there's an increasing recognition of the role of nature-based solutions to provide carbon benefits, biodiversity benefits, and resilience benefits. Also on the agricultural side, there's this intention to grow the sector while keeping emissions relatively flat. And so there's an opportunity for innovation in this space. And the recent budget also announced um, investments for agricultural climate action and made specific reference to reverse auctions, which for those in the PES space know that that is one strategy to create sort of efficient conditions to engage in PES. And so that's the first sort of hint of seeing that level of action from the, from the federal level. The other thing that's interesting beyond the government context are the range of actors paying attention. And, and Chris hinted at this with some of the examples he gave at the end of his presentation. Um, the insurance sector, for one, with the rising costs of climate change, thinking about floods and flood regulation, there's a recognition that natural infrastructure investing in wetland restoration or coastal restoration, for instance, um, has, is a real opportunity to save costs uh, and to reduce the impacts on, on private property, um, as well as municipal property since they are also insured. And the Insurance Bureau of Canada is working across and speaking with many municipalities in the country um, to explore potential arrangements. Uh, and there's some other exciting international examples. The one that's often brought up is in Cancun, a reef restoration strategy that I'd be happy to talk further about if folks are interested. Um, the financial sector, there's a ton of consumer demand on the responsible investment side. Green bond growth is tremendous uh, and emerging regulations starting in the EU, but we can imagine sort of a, a trickle down happening in North America. Um, and just last week, the nature, the task force on nature related financial disclosures was launched. This mirrors the task force on climate related financial disclosures. And this means banks, financial institutions, institutional in investors, um, as well as certain companies are going to have to talk about the impact that they have on nature. And in accounting for that, 
it means that we're going to get more ecosystem related data that is very useful, um, but also means that practices will have to be changed. And to transition to that, there's likely going to be more demand for different types of nature based solution investments or participating in some of these types of market based instruments. I also briefly wanted to mention accounting. Um, this is an interesting barrier, um, but also where there's action happening right at the moment. Um, the Public Services, Public Sector Accounting Board um, has a proposal going forward to better account for um, ecosystem services in accounting across Canada. The classic Canadian example is in Gibsons, BC, where there was interest in um, from the town to commit money to conserve the watershed uh, in order to prevent uh, the need to invest in a um, water purification, sort of like that classic New York City example that uh, Jim referred to. And they couldn't because in the actual accounting practices would not let them put uh, nature or a watershed as an asset, whereas you could put a water purification structure as an asset. And so that eventually changed, but it was a process to get that to happen and then only happened on a provincial scale. And so it's one of those barriers that we don't always anticipate um, and, and take some working around, but also demonstrates the openness to considering ecosystem services as a genuine asset. Um, and as others have pointed to as well, it's not just the regulated industries that are thinking about offsets and other types of market-based instruments and investments in nature-based solutions. There's these tremendous number of net zero commitments that people are trying to figure out how to operationalize and, and have actually be credible and meaningful. And then also, you know, if you consider that as sort of the CSR or the corporate social responsibility approach, there's also the recognition that as companies are tracking their impact, that there's a real material risk to their ability to either continue to be in business, to, to have supply chain confidence, um, that investing in either nature-based strategies, in conserving um, and thinking about the way that they manage resources differently um, is leading to more participation in these markets. And so in the Canadian context, and there's certainly more, and I'm just going to highlight a few here, there's a range of policy opportunities sort of right now. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, at the moment, Canada is federally developing its new offset carbon offset regulations with several offset protocols. Sort of an initial first round has been put out, soil carbon and improved forest management are on that first slate. Um, and there's a question of, you know, what will those look like? Can we adapt them or include others that will improve investments from considering the North, for example, or some of these regions that are currently hard to do or hard to manage under existing protocols. This issue of ecosystem service rights on Crown land, carbon is a focal area at the moment, but of course this could also um, pertain to water and biodiversity. Currently in BC, there's an arrangement that you can um, sell the, it's the um, benefits, oh, I've, I haven't written it down, but the um, benefit sharing agreement allows Indigenous groups to sell carbon credits from Crown lands. And it's something that we are likely going to need to explore if we want to scale the carbon offset market in Canada. Green bonds, I won't get into a ton of detail, but again, in the recent federal budget, there was an announcement that Canada is going to do or release several federal green bonds and nature conservation was listed as a possible avenue for that. At the moment, for many of the green bonds that have come out, while nature, I'm thinking of Quebec and Ontario in particular, um, conservation has been listed as something that could be included, but there have been very few projects. And the reason for that, or one of the reasons at least, is that it's much easier, the types of financial data that are required um, to evaluate risk are just a lot more straightforward if you're thinking about a renewable energy investment, for example. And so again, it comes back to this issue of data and what types of ecological data and ecological impact data are needed, as well as how we can translate that into viable um, financial data, for example, having a, a bond rating, for example, for, for a nature related project. In Canada, the new agricultural policy framework is going to be it's going to start in 2023. And so the consultations are already underway. This is the massive overarching provincial, territorial, federal policy framework. And so for things like payment for ecosystem service programs or other types of incentives, they could be embedded in this. So it's an opportunity to engage on that front. And, and overall, I guess 
cumulatively, I think all of these make the case for tracking ecosystem service data more systematically and having it be more accessible, because that's certainly a barrier for project development. Um, and this mandating the nature-related financial disclosures could help feed into that. And finally, and this is, you know, a broad overview, and I invite you to check out the report and some of the other publications that I've included in the expo and some of Smart Prosperity's other work in this space. But we see a range of opportunities that both public and private investment can be brought to nature-based strategies. Um, and here's a few opportunities, you know, regulatory certainty is absolutely essential, especially for private investors. Um, Ontario ultimately backed out of the, um, the Western Climate Initiative with, that was participating with California that Quebec is still a part of, um, you know, which just really creates a challenge for people who want to have confidence. Um, Canada's new carbon price is an example of having that confidence of where price is going to be set so investors know how to act and, and where to invest. We're going to see a lot of blended finance mechanisms in this space. And so this means that government can provide seed funding, upfront capital, um, act as a guarantor and have other ways to de-risk different types of market-based instruments to attract new funding and new actors. And overall, this is also something that we're seeing outside of Canada is that there's a lot of intermediaries. So for example, in the forest resilience bond, you know, there's an, an intermediary that brings all of the relevant actors to the table and, and helps determine what their needs are in order to facilitate um, action, payment structures, et cetera. Um, and, and underpinning all of this, as I said before, there's this need to collect, maintain, and have op open access to ecosystem service and financial data that relate to nature in order to help move forward all of these markets broadly. So I realized that was a bit of a whirlwind, um, but to keep things brief, I wanted to do a broad overview and welcome more specific questions either today or please feel free to follow up. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Paige. Um... I am amazed at the breadth of topics that you and our previous speakers are managing to cover in very limited time frames. Thanks very much for your contribution. Our next speaker is Jillian Kerr, who I believe is going to be bringing our focus back to Alberta. Yes, um, I so am. Over so thank you, you very Jillian. much, Dave. Thanks. Uh, so thank you very much. I just would like to acknowledge that I am presenting to you guys uh, from the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people in the Annapolis Valley here in Nova Scotia. And uh, I just took a few notes to try to link in my presentation with uh, what we've been hearing to date. So I, I, I guess the first thing to say is I, I worked for the Department of Environment or the Ministry of Environment and Parks in Alberta for 12 years during a very exciting period. I started in 2004. I was an environmental economist. I worked on ecosystem services. Uh, I got to work on a number of really interesting and innovative policy and regulation and legislation. And uh, my last sort of position there was uh, manager of the biodiversity and ecosystem services group. So um, I, I, I felt like it was a wonderful and very exciting place to work for a long time. And one of the key things I did work on was the introduction or implementation of market-based instruments into the Department of Environment's um, environmental tools process. Like how are we going to manage and meet the expectation outcome of our various policy and regulatory mandates and was very disappointed and confused uh, when we had done so much work on promoting market-based instruments and yet we really didn't implement many. So many. So my, my period that I'm going to be speaking about right now is between uh, 2000 and 2015 and um, I'm looking, this is a sort of a case study on uh, specifically this, this paper, this presentation on the internal institutional challenges, the practical governance challenges. I did, a, my PhD was a paper-based one, so this is my, my second uh, large paper, and it was looking internally at the government of Alberta and the, what happened inside the department to lead to the implementation gap that we ended up seeing. So obviously for those of you in, you know, around Canada, this is, is an obvious uh, map, but for those outside, this is the province of Alberta, and this is where this case study is focused on. And I guess the, the big thing for me uh, is that I uh, originally was brought in uh, with, it wasn't just a few of us that wanted to try to push market-based instruments like a number of environmental economists. We had a broad base of interest. Um, Ed Stelmeck, one of our premiers, uh, actually pushed for market-based instruments and ecosystem services to be a much more prevalent part of how we did business in Alberta. Um, so 
you know, in 2010, we were really poised to be leaders, I think, in Canada on market-based insurance, including some of the work we did in offsets within at least the Canadian government context. And, you know, just to give you a little bit of context, we had 43 years of the same Conservative Party that lasted up until 2015. So we had a fairly consistent governance framework that had a pro-market um, it was a pro-market area where they were, you know, very open to looking at alternates to just regulation. We had enabled market-based instruments, whether it was labeled as market-based instrument or offsets or water uh, markets specifically um, or generically in our Water Act, our Environmental Protection and Enhancement Act, our Cumulative Effects Management Act, our Alberta Land Stewardship Act. So these are big, big um, you know, legislative mandates for our department. We also had a number of market-based instruments, both generically as market-based instruments or economic instruments, or in sort of specific uh, typical tool or, or specific tools in our water for life strategy, in our land use framework. Um, the Institute of Agriculture, Forestry and Environment was stood up by Premier Ed Stelmack to look at market-based instruments and, in, you know, in the environment and our natural resource area and our new the relatively new Alberta wetland policy enabled market-based instruments. So, and we actively work with NGOs, environment, non-governments, resource industries, environmentalists, to look at the potential of these market-based instruments. And uh, unlike other evidence we heard from other jurisdictions, we ended up with a, a large pool of various stakeholders that were excited or interested or willing to look at using market-based instruments. So I'm focusing this research on Alberta environment and parks as, a, as the primary source of environmental legislation, although we know agriculture, forestry, there are a number of other ministries that, um, that hold important policy and, and legislation, but this is focused specifically on that. And what I looked at in my first of my um, paper-based uh, part of my PhD was we talk about this idea that we worked on market-based instruments and there were some people talking about the fact that, well, we don't seem to have many, but no one had actually done the research to actually find out what was going on. And so in the, my first uh, you know, paper for my PhD, what, what we established based on you know, the legislation and the policy is there were 57 distinct market-based instrument commitments that were made by the Ministry of Environment and Parks Sorry, I've used different names because the department changes names uh, re regularly. Uh, but there were 57 commitments made. And so and this is during the period of 2000 to 2015. And of all those commitments, only 13 were implemented. And of that, only seven were, were, were really unique. And, and the difference between the seven and the 13 were uh, a number of the ones that were actually enabled during this time had kind of piggybacked on similar market-based instruments, such as you know, bottle, when you, when you take your bottles back, you have a, you know, a, a fee that you pay and you get that fee back. So that kind of replacement fee or giving the fee back to people for tires and a number of different things they did, they actually were implemented, but they weren't really unique. So this was really perplexing about what was going on here. And so, as I said, uh, this is from my second part of my PhD. What I wanted to look at is what's going on inside the Department of Environment. Um, so the rest of my PhD looked at um, what was happening outside of the, you know, the, the government, like what were some of the things happening in the, uh, either in the different regions of Alberta, different resource groups of Alberta that might be leading to this implementation gap. But for this, I'm focusing on the internal, informal institutional issues that we have within the department. So institutional fit refers to these norms and unwritten rules. So, you know, Jim had brought up, brought up when he was speaking about these institutional failure and uh, market failure. And generally most of the papers and, and research that's been done have looked at things external. It's not really focused on the departments that are developing these tools. So I wanted to look at the internal, what's going on in the department. So market-based instruments have to be viewed as acceptable, which depends on a whole bunch of things, including the, the social rules that are shared by the department. Are they considered legitimate? Is this a legitimate form of behavior? What are the norms of the organization? And one of the Canadian sort of leaders in gov environmental governance, um, it, it, you know, is Howlett. Uh, but addressing Howlett and Somerville, I, I did a lot of research looking into Howlett's work. They talk about the fact that each jurisdiction has its own pattern of social conflict that predisposes its decision makers to choose particular instruments. 
So that gave me the idea to look at what was going on. What are those institutional norms and behaviors inside our department that may have been played a part in this, this implementation gap? And then finally, um, the policy culture is part of this un informal institutional structure. So it's not written down. It's not in people's job descriptions. It's in how things happen day to day and sort of these self-imposed codes of conduct. And so I decided to use the theory of planned behavior. And again, I'm willing to answer questions uh, specifically to the method I used. Um, this, this theory I wanted to use because it basically looked at these different types of beliefs and then tried to look at what the intention was behind the people or group to see what their behavior, what did they end up having as behavior. And to do this, I uh, interviewed did 19 semi-structured interviews with uh, economists, policy advisors, uh, policy managers, and even two Australian um, economic experts who we had brought in over periods of five to six years to help us specifically on different market-based instruments. And the reason I went outside the department is they had, they worked with Australia and they worked with here, and they had some really interesting insights on working with um, our staff you know, in, in the department. And so again, just noting the time, and I'm very happy to go into this in more detail, uh, and there's a paper coming out on this. Some of the key institutional governance issues that actually were revealed, and, and these are not rocket science, people probably could have guessed at these, but we have, we have, you know, we have, inter, we have discipline, we have proof now that these are part of what was happening to lead to the implementation gap in Alberta, where one of the things was path dependency. So when you have people that are specialized, and most, in, you know, environmental related departments have traditionally had been staffed by natural scientists and engineers. And I know within our Department of Environment, while I was there, we started an economics and sociology group. It was very small. Uh, I don't think it exists, at least in the same way now. So part of this is that people have been trained and they have disciplinary expertise that it, in the traditional way that we have done environmental governance, and that has been regulation, legislation, and one of our ex-ministers used to call it the uh, the nail them and jail them uh, group, you know, that we were the nail. He, he wasn't always that pleased with us, but, you know, there we set a line in the sand. If you go over that line in the sand, you're penalized. And that is the disciplinary background of m most of the staff. The other thing was a trust in process. There was definitely a distrust of economics. Uh, I, I was a little surprised. I shouldn't have been. I was a little surprised at that. But uh, market-based instruments market-based instruments being based in economics, there was already a distrust about what the um, ideas and principles and assumptions about market-based instruments. There also is a lack of belief generally in non-regulatory approaches. So, uh, you know, the traditional regulatory approach, we also tried to look at all these other ways that governments and groups were trying to meet their environmental objectives, things like information disclosure, voluntary agreements, market-based instruments. So there was definitely a distrust in any tool that was non-regulatory. And part of that is because we have very little experience with them or, or most of the staff have very little experience with them. The, this is the final point that I'm going to focus on and then I'm gonna close it down and ask questions was around legitimacy. And, and Jim brought up the idea, the concept of legitimacy um, and, I, and slightly different and different um, uh, context, but the regulatory agencies regulate. And so this idea of incenting participants or companies or uh, an entire industry and allowing them to make decisions based on their own internal information was, was very uncomfortable for our, our staff or most of our staff. And so I, while we're talking about, I know I'm the wet blanket, everyone wants to talk about positive things that have been happening around market-based instruments and offsets and all the rest of it. Um, I really think it's important when we look at trying to bring in these new ways of doing things is to remember not only do we need to get acceptance by the public, but we also need to see the people that are going to have the influence in the levers and the design. We need to understand that context and make sure that they are brought along comfortable if we do want to make sure that market-based instruments are solidly a part of our governance strategy in uh, in Alberta and, and maybe likely in Canada, although I'll, I'll let Paige speak to that. So I'm, I'm going to conclude there and I think we're going to Q&A. All right, so we've got uh, two questions in four minutes. So we're going to do some rapid, rapid information transfer. Um, so the first one was, how can we use PES in the form of periodic payments to secure benefits that may not occur 
until a later date. For example, trees may not yield benefits for many decades. And I'm going to I'm going to touch this one in about about 30 seconds. Um, this is a, this is a classic challenge with 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 most PES. Um, and there are two ways to think about it. One is what you're paying for. Um, most PES programs pay for inputs rather than outputs. They pay for land management rather than the benefits that the land is producing. Um, it's easier to measure the landholders, that, that's what they want. And so that's an inherent risk, um, which gets to the second point, which is PES payments in this context are essentially allocation of risk, right? And you are basically paying landholders as they make those changes, which they need to be paid for, they need to meet their they, to, to have their opportunity cost match. You're you're taking the risk that your the land management changes can produce the service you want, and there won't be some kind of intervening factor like a forest fire. And so the short answer is um, you have to decide input output in these types of situations. But really, the the, the payment scheme uh, mirrors risk allocation, uh, how you're going to allocate risk in a contract. Second question. What practical criteria can we use to determine if MPIs or command and control is the best policy tool in any particular circumstance? Um, so this is based horses for courses. Uh, so Paige, why don't you start off and we'll just we'll do everyone and just do rapid fire. Sure. So I, I'll just very briefly suggest that, you know, the place to start is to see what ecosystem services you have and whether you can value them or not. And if there is someone that is willing to pay for them, um, if not, it becomes a lot more challenging to have a market based instrument. Um, but that said, you know, the buyers could be people that are regulated to purchase those um, different types of ecosystem service values or those with a vested interest, like the insurance company that I mentioned or others that are entering the space. That said, we can still use policy to help create those markets. And indeed, in most cases, that is what we've seen where there are robust markets. So there's definitely a place for regulation regardless. Carmen, à vous. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course. But um, as a little uh, discuss, we, for example, in the case of upsettings here in France, we, we study seven uh, criteria that can help us to better uh, build this market basis instrument. But we forget something that uh, was uh, really important for us. And one of the examples is what happened in uh, 2017 here in France. We have a sen senatorial report, a senatorial uh, very important um, uh, time where uh, we discover uh, that all of these market instruments have to uh, involve society because uh, uh, these instruments are also um, generating social concern. And we are not taking into account uh, sometime all of these uh, important uh, social concerns. So I think uh, one of the um, particular circumstances that are not only technical uh, in our financial markets are uh, these social issues. Um, one of the uh, measures that was used here in France is the minimum duration time of engagement. And uh, we choose to, to work in 30 years engagement time, for example. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think everyone else has really touched on, on some of it. I think it's it's broadening the time scale for a lot of these. One of the ones that, that I wanted to touch on, you know, other than social and legislative and government and markets is technology. And so there is a, a really interesting um, a case study uh, done from the Washington DC based Pinchot Institute and the USDA for uh, 46 non-industrial private forest landowners in Washington and Oregon. 46 of them were engaged in the study for carbon accounting. Only one of them went through the entirety of the process, 45 dropped out. And that's because the challenges was in using technology to um, this, this particular technology to actually go through their forest land and determine how much carbon uh, it, would, it, would, it would protect and they couldn't figure it out. So we need to up the technology in that, in that respect. And then you also need to reduce some of the burdens on those landowners so that they can see the long-term scale and they can see that the money will come in over the long period of time. Um, and there's going to be a way to sort of to make that work uh, up front. All right, I'll pass Jillian, over to Jillian. 30 seconds. I'll be super quick. These are all questions that we also looked at. And so we developed the environmental tool guide. At, it's on the Alberta Environment um, Protection website to look at the various criteria, including technology, effectiveness, political feasibility, and coming up with sort of what, what do we ask ourselves when we're considering these things, with, at least with us within the department. So the environmental tool guide, Alberta Environment and Parks. Dave, take it away. 
Okay, thanks, Jim. And well, um, as with all good times, time has flown by. Um, so um, unfortunately, I have to bring uh, our main session to a close. Um, but I do want to make a few closing comments in the process. Um, first, I'd like to thank all of today's speakers um, for contributing in a very thoughtful manner on, on, a, on a broad and complex subject. Uh, many thanks to, to Jim, Carmen, Chris, Paige, and Jillian. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors and partners, uh, Alberta Innovates, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, uh, ConocoPhillips Canada, and Tech. And I would personally like to thank all of my ALI colleagues for all the work they put into um, both this session and making this series a success overall. And with that, I will call things to a close. Thank you very much for uh, your participation today. I do want to remind you to make sure you register for the final uh, session in this series, uh, which will occur next week. We're looking at offsetting in the Canadian context uh, with Vic Adamovich, Jillian Kerr returning, Karen Stefanik, a previous speaker returning, Valerie Dupont, and, Cal and Carol Stefan. Um, thank you for joining us today.